One more time, I turn you over to Dr. Paul Cote. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here today. Um, my only disclosure is that I'm a salaried physician from the Guam Regional Medical City. Um, I've previously worked in Maui, Hawaii, and also Bermuda, so I have experience working on small islands. Um, next slide, please. And today I've been asked, oh, just back up one. Okay, so today I've been asked to speak about cancer screening. Um, it's a very big topic, and it seems like in the flyer, all of us, all the doctors presenting are talking about the same thing. So um, I thought I would talk more, uh, a little bit in the beginning about what the cancer rates are on Guam, because every time I go to a small island, everybody in the island thinks it's a cancer epidemic, and there's more cancer on the island than anywhere else in the world. So I thought I would just start a little bit with some facts and figures. Um, but on a side note, I got very sick with some upper respiratory condition um, in October, and I realized that the island, uh, everyone's, everyone has the same problem. The, res the infection rates and the ER for upper respiratory infections was two times the five-year normal. Next slide, please. So, um, I did a little bit of emailing and phone calls, and um, I found some cancer data on Guam, and this is with permission from Renata Bordallo. The next eight slides come from her presentation that she gave December 13, 2013. Next slide. And her source of information is the Guam Cancer Registry from the database. Um, and they pooled together five years from 2007 to uh, 2011. And they ha there's 1,942 cases that were cancer ca new cancer cases diagnosed in Guam. And so this is a rate of, ca of new cancers in Guam. And I'm going to get back to that uh, in a few more slides. We'll talk about how does that compare to the rest of the United States. Next slide. Uh, other little bits of information, uh, interesting. So here's the rates from 2007 through 2011, 1,942. And the incidence here, so here's uh, 1998 to 2002 is 1,336. And I think um, in discussion with the Guam Cancer um, Registry is that there's probably errors in data collection, so this might not be a real number. Um, there might not be this kind of growth in cancer incidence. This might have to do actually with data collection and proving on, on the island. Next slide. And here's broken down by sites in the body and breast cancer again, as we've heard before, has the highest incidence, lung, uh, and in men, you have prostate cancer, and lung is very high, um, and then colon cancer, liver, thyroid. Next slide, please. This slide is interesting. It's um, mostly what I wanted to point out is here breast cancer is very high in incidence, but mortality is actually not number one. It's down on the list, and we think a lot of that has to do with finding the cancers early and, and women getting screened and having high cure rates. Next slide. And here's just by um, gender, so male prostate, lung, colon, and female breast, cervical, lung, colon, the top cancers. Next slide. Um, this slide was here. I thought people would be interested to see this, just a breakdown by um, ethnic, racial, ethnic distribution of cancer cases in Guam. And I'm guessing that this probably just parallels the normal population, um, that I don't think there's more cancer in Chamorros. I think it's probably just that there are more Chamorros on the island than there are Caucasians. Next slide. This slide was a little bit of data um, from the presentation. Here's m mammogram rates. Guam, a little bit lower than the U.S. Um, PAP tests, Guam, a little bit lower than the U.S. I'm, the source, I'm not familiar with where this comes from. I'm not sure how accurate this data is. Next slide. And again, uh, cancer screening, colonoscopy, 
for colon cancer screening. Guam is a little bit lower. And this is a PSA test for prostate cancer, and Guam is lower than the rest of the United States. Next slide, please. So how do we figure out, uh, is there an epidemic of cancer in Guam or not? And <clears throat> you can go online and there's a thing called the SEER database that collects cancer statistics in the United States population. Next slide. And if you look online, you can find the incidence, which is how many cancers occur within each year. And the SEER database, they look at nine different areas in the United States. Um, one of them is Hawaii, interestingly enough. Next slide. And in 2011, the incidence was 453, and those nine communities pulled together um, in, in 2007, it's 481. And this is per 100,000 patients. And that's roughly about half a percent of the population of in any community in the United States, what you would expect is about half the about half a percent of the population is going to come down with cancer every year. And if we look at just Hawaii, then but from 2007 to um, 2011, the incidence is 422. Next slide. So with a little bit of math, you look at the Guam Cancer Registry, we have five years, uh, 1,942 cases, and you do the math. And then in Guam, you come down, you calculate 410 cases um, based on the 2010 census of the population at that time. You get 410 cases per 100,000. And in Hawaii, it was 422 cases. So uh, if you look at the statistics on Guam, actually Guam has a lower cancer rate of incidence of ca new cancers than in Hawaii and the rest of the mainland. And uh, in discussion with the Guam Cancer Registry, this is probably um, probably not true. It's probably that Guam does not have a lower cancer incidence. Most likely it's just that there's some underreporting. Not all the cancer, new cancers are picked up by the registry is, is just a guess. Um, so the good news is that there's not an explosion of cancer in Guam, but everybody knows somebody with cancer, so it just feels like the cancer rates are quite high. Unfortunately, it is a problem all over the United States and every island and most populations all over the world. Next slide. So what is, what is cancer screening? So the idea of cancer screening is um, to look and detect cancer before a patient has signs or symptoms of cancer. That's the idea. We're trying to pick something up that's not yet really a problem for the patient. And, and why do we do cancer screening? The idea is to find a cancer which you can do something about, and then you have a better outcome. So there's no point in finding something early if you can't do anything about it, and it's not gonna improve um, patient care. And I just was trying to think of an example of what that means, so I thought, okay, if I wake up in the morning, I'm gonna go to work, and my, my sink is leaking. Um, if I don't turn the water off in the morning, and I come back at the end of the day, my whole house is flooded. So. That's kind of the idea, is to find something early and treat it before it's a much bigger problem. Next slide. And um, in general, we say cancer screening works when we can find the cancer early, and we want to do a treatment. So what treatments do we have? Most of the time it's surgery, but not always. And um, we, we can do research on cancer screening because we look if we could find the cancer and we do a treatment, we want to have a better chance, the patient a better chance of not dying from the cancer. So the idea is to find something early that gives the, and do a treatment that allows the patient to not die from the cancer. So we're, we're helping the patient um, in their survival from the cancer. And when we say cancer screening works, so we're, we're looking at a lot of statistics. It's very difficult to accomplish because you have to look at large groups of the population and you have to do um, treatments over tens of thousands of patients. You have to follow patients for many, many years, sometimes a decade or more, sometimes two decades, 20 years. Um, and, and there are, controver there are uh, controversies with cancer screening and I just want to not go in depth on the controversies, but touch a, a little bit about the concept of controversy. Next slide. 
So there is agreement for cancer screening for breast cancer, cervical cancer, lung cancer, and colon cancers. Um, but the controversies relate to what age to start and how often to do the screening. And sometimes you'll see big newspaper articles, um, you know, like breast cancer screening start at age 40, start at age 50. You sometimes you'll see mammograms every year, sometimes mammograms every other year. But for breast cancer, there's an agreement among scientists and doctors that, that breast cancer screening does work um, to save lives. Lung cancer screening is a, is a relatively new addition. It's only for high-risk patients, those uh, the who, for smokers mostly. And cancer screening for prostate cancer was very uh, active and promoted, but more recently researchers are not sure if screening for prostate cancer is actually going to improve patients' survival and a chance of not dying from prostate cancer. Next slide. So, in summary, um, in the short time I have, I just thought I would give the recommendations from, um, not all the recommendations from every group that gives recommendations, but just picking one of the uh, accepted, highly accredited groups in the United States for s screening um, recommendations. So the National Conference of Cancer Network is a very large, um, organization in the United States and what they do is they pull together experts in, in each field like experts in breast cancer, experts in breast cancer screening in this case and they'll get 30 experts, put them in a room and decide on what should be the standard of care in the United States and most oncologists in the United States follow NCCN guidelines. It's very well accepted probably among 99% of oncologists in the United States. So uh, their recommendation for breast cancer screening is the average risk woman, uh, which is what we heard before, ages 25 to 39, clinical breast exam, clinical meaning by a, by a doctor every one to three years, and breast awareness, which was talked about uh, from the last speaker, essentially uh, introducing the concept of a woman doing self-exam. And then starting at age 40 and older, an annual breast exam, Again, an exam by a doctor, an annual screening mammogram, and again, continuing with breast awareness, essentially educating or discussing with the woman about touching her own breasts and identifying either discoloration or lumps or discharge. Next slide. So from the American Cancer Society, the American Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, and the American Society of Clinical Pathology, is here's recommendations for cervical cancer. So age less than 21 years, no screening is recommended, age 21 to 29, cytology alone every three years, like a pap smear, and age 30 to 65 now, many centers are including HPV, um, human papillomavirus detection, and cytology, calling together, they call it co-testing, to do that every five years, or cytology like a pap smear every three years, and age over 65, no screening if the woman has been testing negative over um, a, a time frame like maybe 10 years, it kind of varies depending on which guidelines you read. Next slide. And prostate cancer, prostate cancer, um, they call it early detection, and the word screening here is not used intentionally because in prostate cancer, because there's such controversy whether finding prostate cancer early actually leads to improved survival rates. Um, so some doctors think it's important to, to screen for prostate cancer. Other organizations think it shouldn't be done at all. They think that the risk of screening and doing all the procedures in finding the cancer is going to cause more problems than, than help the men who, who get um, diagnosed with prostate cancer. There is, there is a, a consensus among oncologists from the NCCN guidelines that men should be offered prostate cancer screening through a digital rectal exam called the DRE and PSA testing, which is a blood test. And the idea is that 
the man, the patient, can make the informed choice. So it's not a mandatory, everybody should do this, it's the doctor sitting down with the patient and saying, okay, if you want to, if you want to screen for prostate cancer, this is what it means, this is what we do, these are what the risks are, so that if you, if you find prostate cancer with an elevated PSA, you're at high risk, it means you have to have biopsies, you might need to have treatment for a prostate cancer. It's not proven if that treatment might increase your chance of survival. So it, it's controversial, but it allows the patient to make an informed decision. It's um, the new style of practicing medicine now in the mainland, especially. Um, so there's a there's a, a little guide as to what to do if you have if you do a, a digital rectal exam. It's normal, um, and you have a low PSA. So check once if they, between the age of 45 and 49, then repeat at the age of 50, then between the ages of 50 to 70, they're saying if you do a digital rectal exam and a PSA, and repeat it every one or two year intervals if there's no evidence of suspicion for prostate cancer. At age greater than 70, um, it says follow 850 to 70 recommendations. And then, and again, this is another uh, point that doctors and scientists don't agree is it kind of depends on the patient. There are some 75 year olds that are very, very healthy and can live 10, 15 more years, and other patients who are um, not healthy, they're not well, they have other medical problems, and it might not be appropriate to be looking for prostate cancer when they're quite sick with other medical um, conditions. And um, so prostate cancer, again, is, is detection. It means that we don't call it screening on this slide. The NCCA guidelines um, is being very careful here. But essentially, every man should have a conversation with their physician, certainly if they're age 50, um, or older should have a conversation with their physician about getting a PSA test and a digital rectal exam and what it means and what are the risks and benefits. Um, but that's, that's pretty much my talk. I just was giving an outline of what the screening is. If, 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 when I looked on the flyer, every doctor is talking about the same thing, so I didn't want to, uh, hopefully we're not all duplicating the same information. All right. Uh, thank you so much again, ladies and gentlemen. You. Put your hands together uh, for Dr. Koti. Thank you so much, sir.